schedule, David. Let me know. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us today as USITT continues our community conversations. My name is David Stewart, known as D. Stu throughout the industry, and my pronouns are he and him. And I currently reside on the stolen lands of the Seminole people, which is also known as Orlando, Florida. A visual descriptor for those who may not be able to see me, I am a light-skinned black man uh, that is bald, as everyone likes to point out. I have a full beard that is about half gray and half black. I have glasses and two earrings, and I am wearing a blue and darker blue floral print shirt. Um, I am also the chair for USITT's ED&I committee, and today we are pleased to continue our community conversations with today's focus on costumes. Today's discussion will be moderated by Lux Hawk, and I now turn things over to her. So take it away, my friends. Have a great session. We'll see you back at the end. Wonderful. Thank you so much, D. Stu. Yeah. Uh, hello. My name is Lux Hawk. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I am streaming to you from Lenape Hoking, also known as Brooklyn. Uh, I am a costume designer, illustrator, and educator. And I would like to take this moment to just invite everyone uh, watching us to log on to the website uh, native-land.ca and see where you are streaming from. And perhaps after that, take a moment to do a little research. Uh, and with that, I am going to also introduce my panelists here with me today. Um, Deb, could you introduce yourself? Great. Hi, yeah, I'm Deb Sivney. Uh, it is she, her pronouns. I am uh, streaming in from Piscataway land, otherwise known as Washington, D.C., and Maryland and lands around. And I am a costume and scenic designer and an educator. Great, and Mel. Mel. Hi, I'm Mel on she, her pronouns. Um, I'm calling in from the ancestral lands of the Lenape people, colonially known as New York. And I'm a costume designer, educator, and writer. Fantastic. Uh, we will also be joined a little later by Dominique Von Hill, uh, who is en route. So um, to kick things off, I wanted to ask the, the most kind of obvious question. How did everyone come to costume design? Uh, Mel, would you like to start? Sure. <laughs> um, I came to costume design through, uh, well, I mean, and I started in college towards the end of my college years, actually. Um, but I really came to it from a very, um, academic lens. I went to the University of Chicago. Um, I was always interested in theater, but I went to school primarily thinking that I was going to uh, become like an English professor. So specifically in Shakespeare. Um, and, you know, I, I participated in the student theater group on campus and for the first few years was trying to kind of find out where I landed. It was pretty organized. So I did stage management, I did production management. Um, and finally, in my third year of college, took a design class and got really interested in it. And um, then had the opportunity to assist a costume designer, a professional costume designer from the Chicago area that came in to work on a show and just learned like, wow, this is visual storytelling. Like this is dramaturgy, but visual. <laughs> um, and was really blown away with just her process and learning about the process of costume design and um, kind of didn't stop since. <laughs> so that's my story. Awesome. I think that uh, tends to be a common thread uh, for people that you kind of start off on one path, discover costume design and get very like um, distracted and kind of fall in love with it. Uh, I know for me, I grew up doing a lot of drawing and painting. My mother was a ceramic artist and a photographer and just had a I had an appreciation for theater. I think I thought initially mm -hmm. I would be an actor. Uh, quickly realized that was not something that I was that interested in, but 
in discovering kind of theater uh, in undergrad, I was led down this kind of costume design path and just fell in love with it. It's this great marriage of uh, visual artistry with dramaturgy and character work and just storytelling. So I think I, that your response also just really, really resonates with me. Uh, Deb, same question. I'm like, oh, wow, same here. So yeah, I went to Middlebury College in Vermont with also super academic background uh, with, the, with the notion that I would become a linguist. <laughs> so I used to be a classics major, uh, but I also sewed since I was a kid and I needed a work study job. And this was back in the day when like all the jobs were pinned, you know, at the student center. And so I saw this job costume shop. And I was like, oh my God, could I, could I work there? And so, you know, I called the number <laughs> and um, they call me and I walk down there with like this shirt that I've made and uh, you know, what can you do? And I'm like, well, I made this shirt. And they're like, you are hired. I now understand years later, <laughs> having hired many a, a costume shop student, and I'm like, oh, okay, now I totally understand. Uh, but I think from there, I worked in the shop, and I was like, costume design is a job? You can do that? Wow, I had no idea. I literally had no idea. I and mean, that, that was the, the beginning of you know, all of that. Um, I've always been fascinated with the way that people think. And uh, psychology is a huge part of it for me. And um, yeah, the marriage of psychology and history and art and fashion and just aesthetics and, and people and world building. I, I loved all of it. I just, I never looked back to it. I, I completely agree. I think uh, what some people don't realize about costume design is just how many other jobs kind of fall into the category and how many interesting things you and like pathways you get to delve down. But that said, when you start a new project, uh, knowing, knowing that all processes kind of start with the script, what is your favorite way to set yourself up for success? Um, how do you like to get into a project? And let's see, uh, Mel, do you mind? <laughs> yeah, I was like, <laughs> sorry. I could take that. Um, yeah, I, I think for me, it really does start with the text because um, I very much, you know, started in that realm of like text analysis. Um, but I think the other thing that I really enjoy doing too is kind of let my mind really wander and riff a little bit. So. If I'm reading a play, I start to think like, oh, uh, there are some movies that this reminds me of, or like there are some films from this era that I could go down. Or, you know, if it's a genre that's like, a, I don't know, like for example, I worked on a production of Peerless by Jihei Park a couple years ago, and you know, it's got this like really horror camp vibe. So, it's, uh, so I started, I mean, it was watching Heathers and things like that. Um, and, um, but also thinking about like South Korean horror films and what, you know, it's, it kind of, I work in a really collage style. So I'm like, oh, how do I bring these different aesthetics or different styles together? Um, and yeah, film tends to be really a way that I uh, get into the mood of a piece. Um, music really helps too, but I think for me, it's like, I just let, let myself go down a rabbit hole, um, for however long I'm able to, <laughs> depending on deadlines. And then you, you know, and then I kind of, after I've had that time to just kind of marinate or just like go in all sorts of strange directions, um, I snap back into it and, uh and get back to the text again. I don't know, for me, it's kind of like a series of like remembering and forgetting, remembering and forgetting. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really curious to hear from you all as well, like your, your processes. Uh, Deb, do you wanna go next? Yeah, uh, I'm similar in some ways. Yeah, I begin with the text and I read the text like several times and I will often just kind of like write down the things that resonate with me, you know, like a half an hour later and I'll just sort of 
small on that. Or, yeah, sometimes as long as the process will let me, you know, I'll go in and I'll research a little and I'll stop and then I'll dream and then I'll see what other kind of things just sort of come out of the universe. I'll go take a walk and I'll be like, oh, these other things and I'll write those down. And then I gather together just like enormous amounts of research. It's really where my heart lies and is in the research. And uh, after that, then I'll go back and read it again. Because I realized that going down the rabbit hole of research, Mm -hmm. I'll make assumptions that like are no no longer in text, you know, and I'll I'll run back and be like, oh, oh, right, that's actually what that is. Um, And that's how I start to sort of coalesce ideas. And then I start to really link visuals with the text um, and sort of, strongly as I can. Yeah, and in a collage kind of way too. It's a very stream of consciousness. Um, yeah. I think it might drive some others crazy because they're like, we don't know how you came up with that idea. I'm like, I don't know either. It just came to me in a dream. Like that's actually something I say a lot, as cliche as that sounds. Um, I spend just a lot of time thinking about it. I love that. Uh, and letting <laughs> ideas marinate for as long as possible. What about you, Lux? I mean, I, oh. And let's just take a moment. Hi, Dominique. Hi, Dom. Uh, welcome. Uh, if you want to take a moment to uh, introduce yourself, where you're streaming from, pronouns. Oh, Dominique, we can't hear you. No, we can't hear anything. Well, Dominique, while you adjust your settings and we'll let you know when we can hear you, I'm going to jump over and answer that question in the meantime. Uh, Process. Um, I mean, I think uh, similarly, I also tend to uh, let myself dream a lot. I think as designers, we have a lot of intuitive impulses um, that we follow when we're getting into a project. I think for me, after uh, the obvious of we all read the script and and, uh, make a lot of notes, I try to find, similarly to Mel, I think like little touchstone moments um, that remind me of things or I'll jot down a color or an idea just that may not have anything to do with the show, but start kind of really charting out where, how my brain is meandering through the text uh, so that I have something to kind of come back to and a place to uh, begin when after if it's a period show after you've done all of that period research or research on whatever the reality of the show kind of might be that your perspective and your intuitive um design process uh is is such a, a large part of what you bring to that production uh dominique how is your sound Oh, we lost her for a moment. Well, it's technical like difficulties. We know we're working on it. Um, yeah, I think that that for me, just uh, finding, to, to your point, Mel, like finding where maybe it's a, a film that it reminds me of something in it or a, a song or something, something that can like evoke a feeling that I can mm-hmm. reference later to come back to to dissect for myself because it it often, um, Deb, like you were saying, it doesn't make sense to others yeah. when you go through. And it's like, why why did, would you choose this thing? And you're like, because there is a something in my brain that has this as a marker and this means something to me. So yeah. then it's kind of going through the psychology of your perspective on it, on why you think that that correlates. Uh, so riffing off of this question, when you are 
not um, not necessarily in production. How? Where do you find inspiration, and how do you keep your creative cup full? Start in this one. I mean, pre-pandemic, it was museums. Um, in pandemic, I suppose it's honestly it's been from like watching tiny things grow. I have, I have been surrounding myself with plants. Um, mm -hmm. And right now, I'm honestly, I'm just like growing some things from seeds, yeah. you know, and I like, there's that I, I have like a, a friend who just got a kitten, <laughs> uh, you know, and so it's just it's been in the small things and watching the seasons change. Yeah. Um, so I've kind of like taken a, a step back in the world sort of become my museum. You know, yeah. obviously, I'm still watching things and drawing things, but I'm not consuming media. I think as much as I used to, um, but I've kind of, I think I'm spending all day on screen is the last thing I want to do is spend a couple more hours on screen, like watching a film. So yeah. I think I just tried to, to get away, go on walks, watch tiny things grow and, uh, and sort of zoom into that. And that's been really inspiring for me. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Mel, same question. Yeah. Um, I've been doing a lot of things, actually. Um, I And a lot of it started kind of, you know, after, I mean, we've been in this pandemic for over a year now, but started like a couple months in when I sort of realized like, all right, we're in this, you know, this is a pause um, and it's, time to honor it really instead of thinking like oh we're in two months we're gonna reopen you know um i think a big part of it was i was really fortunate to um know this friend who was interested in starting a book group around the artist's way by julia cameron which is um this uh sort of it's a book that you do um in 12 weeks and every week is a different chapter and their time yes <laughs> here it is um i'm doing it too <laughs> you're doing it now oh yeah. awesome yeah. we have to talk about it mm -hmm. um uh i sent it to dom actually last year but um uh yeah so for me it was you know it's 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 modeled after 12-step programs actually which i find really interesting um but you know there are different chapters and each tap each chapter has different tasks and it really encourages you to get back in touch with oh i'm hearing crackling um <laughs> with your inner child and sort of your creative roots um, and so for me, actually, a lot of that was writing when I was younger. So I've really been getting back to that. Um, I've been reading a lot more. I've been taking actually writing classes. There's so many classes online. We hear you. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I've just been, I think for me, actually, I've sort of rediscovered the joy of taking classes and learning new things. Um, you know, there's so many free programs and knowledge shares online these days. Um, and I've been, you know, I've been, um, the other thing that I've been getting into is I uh, got certified in Reiki last year um, because it really, to me, costumes is such a, I mean, I don't think it's just me. I think we all feel this way. It's such a body centered, art um and so i was really interested in this time when we're all so isolated and also disembodied on zoom and things like how do i get back in touch with somatic practice um so that for me has been really fulfilling uh, learning about the body in that way um but yeah those are just some of the things that i've been doing to keep myself creatively occupied. Fantastic. I always find it really interesting to hear about um, how other artists stay inspired. Uh, and Dominique, since we can now hear you, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm so, so excited to see you. First of all, thank you guys for your patience. Um, you can hear me, which is a blessing. Uh, <laughs> Fix it, Jesus. Um, my name is Dominique Von Hill, pronouns she, her. 
um, anything abundant really. And um, I am streaming from Los Angeles, California. Uh, I think that's primarily it, right? Ish. That is it. Um, if you want to take a moment to just jump in a little bit on how you uh, became a costume designer, uh, any any kind of highlights, um, and we can we can go from there. Yeah, um, I became a costume designer primarily from studying criminal justice in undergrad. Um, I was obsessed with like TV shows like CSI Miami, you know, um, and then I talked to my professor uh, countless times about um, other trajectories within the realm of criminal justice and. He was mentioning how it was very theatrical in terms of if you want to go into like litigation or you want to be a prosecutor or anything of that matter. And um, then he was like, are you interested in anything else? And I was like, hmm, I did theater back way when, when I was in high school. And so the ball started rolling and I became obsessed and stopped UCSD for quite some years. And then eventually decided to go there where I attended graduate school with Melissa. And um, yeah, and just been working professionally ever since. So. Fantastic. And just to recap, so did all four of us uh, leave undergrad with a different major than we kind of went in with or? Yeah. <laughs> just yep. for anyone watching who, who feels that they definitely need to know what they're going to do when they enter college. You don't, you'll figure it out. Yeah, I don't. It's never too late. Yep. Um, so the Next question we were asking is kind of where do you as an artist find inspiration? For me? Big question. Me? Yeah. Oh, big so, question. Dominique. Oh, um, everywhere. Like, if you guys haven't noticed already, I'm, ah, like, that's just my life and I'm trying to, like, get better. But also, it's a part of who I am. Like, I function in um, chaos and uh, I find inspiration in like shrubbery. I find it in trash cans. I find it in the homeless community. I find it in graffiti. Um, that's where I make sense out of uh, out of things that to the naked eye probably would look like gibberish. So I like to look at art. Um, I like to look at things that people discard in terms of human connection on the streets. Um, and definitely within the stories of how people dress for comfort and safety and why they do the things that they do. So a lot of psychology, a lot of humility and tons of empathy for sure. Beautiful answer. That's, I think, um, that's nature. Nature does it best. Nature is incredibly inspiring. Uh, mm -hmm. I think for yeah. me in general, um, I go back and look at kind of other other artists that I really enjoy, other mediums I really enjoy. I like to play video games. I like, um, I, I think cinema for most people or film is, uh, you can find these kind of like nostalgic inspiration moments where you go and revisit things that you know you enjoy to kind of spark up your brain, like filling, filling your brain with images that you are creatively just excited by is a tends to be where I how I can kind of get myself into starting to work on a new project. Yeah. Um, so knowing that everyone's process is different, is there something about your particular process that you want people to know? Um, and let's see, Dominique, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, hmm. I think that like, it's never, dependent on the show, it's never the same, right? So for instance, I'm working on this new show right now and I was hella hard on myself in the beginning of the, the process because I was just like, where are your, collage of beautiful rhinestone renderings like where are all these like 10 foot murals and then I was thinking to myself and I was just like this is a new work right it's like water it's like liquid so instinctually you were taught 
in grad school or just with life to have these beautiful renderings, but not everybody communicates in that way. But also if it's a new work, instincts, like trust your instincts, you know that it's always gonna be changing. So there's no real reason to have it set in stone until maybe even after the show goes up and then you can do renderings of like what you created. And so like once that epiphany happened, I was just like, okay, you don't have to approach every single show the same. So the way that I create, it's it's more of like a lot of extending grace to myself, but also understanding that like shake it up a bit, like try different methods and know that you need to trust yourself because you know what you're doing. Well, I think it also, um, you bring up this really amazing point about what the purpose of renderings is. I know for me, a rendering for costumes is a blueprint of my like intention. It is a way to um, express what I, it, it is not the finished product. It is the, the way to express the intention for the costume and it is always morphing and changing. It changes in a fitting, it changes because the script changes. It, it like continues to be this ever evolving thing until it is on stage and the show is open and you are frozen. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. so I think I also just really, uh, like the phrase, just extending grace to yourself. I think that that, that is something that should be in all of our practices. Uh, so Deb, same question. Is there something about your yeah. practice that you'd like people to know? Oh my goodness. I am really, um, as a costume designer, sort of very actor centric. I really like to collaborate with the actor and admittedly I have a hard time figuring out what a design is going to be if I don't know who is in the role because I really want to design the costume for that body in this moment for this production you know, because it will never be the same again. I could even work with the same actor five years later on the same production and that design again would not be the same um, just because of the lives lived, the experience had. And so I I would call, you know, call my process, like, I really want to know um, where the casting, where the actor lies inside that body in that moment. So sometimes, and I love this term, you know, this, this phrase, extending grace, because like, sometimes that means that when I'm working on a new play, that design comes in very late. Like, yeah. there'll be a sketch, and I'll be like, yep, here's my here's what I think we might do, or here's a collage, or here's what I think we might do, and then a design run, I see them do something completely different, and I throw it out, and I start over. And people are like, why you spend so much time? I'm like, no, this isn't gonna work. I'm gonna spend so much time later if I don't start yeah. a new now. Um, and so I think that that's, that's some place that producers may be like, well, she's a little unstable, <laughs> but you know what? I'm gonna do it for the best story that we can tell. Yeah, Mel. Yeah, um, I mean, I relate to a lot of what has already been shared. I, I, um, I too really like to collaborate with the actors. I think for me, actually, the meat of the work really happens in the fitting rooms. Um, I uh, make a lot of discoveries on the fly. I also kind of like to go in to fittings just in this anticipating surprise. <laughs> yeah. um, but my process is really fluid, you know? I kinda, as, the longer I've done this, the more I've been like, nothing is ever set in stone. And actually a big part of the joy is in the discovery. Um, Cause you know, if we knew all the answers, it just wouldn't be fun anymore. Um, so that's, yeah. I don't know, process, it's mysterious. <laughs> I think it's different. It's different too for everyone. Uh, but something that really, I think resonates with me, Mel, um, with what you're saying is uh, that idea that you just don't, you don't know. I think the thing about my process that people don't always realize is you don't go into these things having answers going into it really excited for the journey and the discovery of what it's going to be. Um, mm -hmm. And I am more excited when you go into a project and I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is yet. We, we have to discover it together. Um, that collaboration is what kind of 
makes you a theater artist. Um, it is the or it it is the thing that kind of makes costume design different from uh, just being like a studio artist or doing an illustration kind of in a void. It's that collaboration that really solidifies it. Um, which leads me to my next question, which is what is your favorite part of your job? Which I will start off by saying for me is the collaborative process. That is what I love about costume design. I love that I get to do it with other people um, and that you get to bounce ideas off of so many amazing humans. Um, I think getting to, this is gonna make it sound a little more glamorous than it actually is, but getting to travel and getting to meet different artists and getting to um, do all these different things. To me, that is really exciting. It makes my brain really happy. And that is what I really love about my job. Uh, let's see, Deb. Uh, same question. What is your favorite part uh, of your job? It's so funny. Like in my head, I was like, oh, oh, the fitting. I love the fitting process. Because I mean, that's like the ultimate moment of discovery. There's the best conversation. Sometimes there's also the hardest conversations. Like I, I, I won't, I won't, you know, sugarcoat it. Like sometimes when I'm going into fittings, I get fitting anxiety. Like hundreds of shows later, I still get massive fitting anxiety. And I, I, I hit that moment where I'm like, why am I doing this? <laughs> I'm still doing this? And then I go to the fittings and I, I just have an amazing time. And then I'm reminded, right, you love it, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think it's it's funny, those two emotions just like butting up right, right against each other. But I love the moment when I like put a garment, you know, a costume on an actor and we're like, that is it, you know? And, the, and that discovery, that aha, that becomes like so obvious and loud in the room and then we go on to stage and we make the most subtle statements and it's so subversive and it's wonderful and like that's I love those little sneaky moments of sort of silent commentary you know without being too blatant like it, there's something so wonderful about being able to tell a story in a totally silent subversive way I think that's really productive as, as a part of the job. Dominique, same question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have to I have to agree with Deb. Uh, there's like this, I think I mentioned this before. Um, well, Shauna Rhimes kind of talked about this moment <laughs> in, uh, in one of her interviews. And she was like, when she creates this, this hum sound. And when she's in the hum, she knows that she's like, on the precipice of something really amazing, even if it doesn't see light, right? She's just like, I'm in my zone. And I think it's like me alone in like the costume shop, just with the mannequin and just figuring it out or me and the fitting, looking at the person's body and like celebrating that. And then it's like this click and you're like, that's it. Because it's not, it's not a singular moment where it's just like with me, you look into the eyes of the person that you're also putting the costume on and they feel it and they do like this movement in the mirror and you're like, okay, we have arrived. Um, and there's nothing like it. And then that's not even with stage lights, right? That's not even with the set behind you supporting you. And then when all that comes together, you're like, this is pretty freaking cool. Um, so yeah, it's those moments in which it all just like makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. There really is nothing else like when you you land on a design and you have that like moment with the actor in the fitting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Mel, same question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, agreed with all of that. <laughs> and I think for me, my favorite thing is connection. Um, you know, something that I realized that I that I missed in the past year with theater and costume design um, is really getting to know people that I might not have met otherwise. And just like hearing all these different stories, not just on stage, but also with the people that I'm working with, you know? I think the thing about costume design and I mean, I think a lot of artists probably feel this way, but when you're in a fitting room, there isn't really a lot of room for small talk 
like you're in it right away. You're it's such a intimate space that you know you're the vulnerability is immediately present. Um, and for me, it's the most satisfying when I connect with a performer. And you know, I've had actors tell me like, "Oh, I used to hate costume fittings, and this one was great." Um, so yeah, for me, it's really building those relationships that I really miss. Completely agree. Um, I think we're all looking forward, uh, once it is safe to do so, to getting back to uh, finding those relationships again within live performance. Um, mm -hmm. So that said, as artists responsible for other people's stories, what parts of you do you feel like are reflected in your work? And let's start with, uh, let's start with Dominique. Um, I think the, I think the off kiltered moments, like in all of my shows, there's something on their body that's off kiltered, whether it's like, and sometimes in the costume shop, they look at me like, Dominique, where are we going? And I'm like, just bear with me. Um, it's one of the pants legs, right? Or him, just a half an inch or a quarter inch higher than the other. There's, I just find it really interesting. And nobody pays attention to this except for me. Um, but I just feel like in some way it seeps into the subconscious mind of individuals and it just makes it more fun. Um, but that's who I am. Like there's, I could be walking one day and be like, oh my God, this is so serious. I think like this is going to be the end of the world. And then I see a squirrel and I'm like, squirrel. Mm -hmm. So my life is pretty, um, it's like a, a phoenix carousel and um, it brings excitement to the work that I do because I always want to make it interesting. Even if it's like, a shirt and pants, you can always find a way to just tweak it so that it's a little bit, um, it's beautiful and it's imperfection. That's what, that's what I always want to show on stage and off stage. Deb, same question. Yeah, I'm totally with Dominique. There's, there's like a, my work, and it's funny how other people have said this to me and then I'm like, oh yeah, actually. And so it's because it's like, what is the thing you do without trying? Like, where are you just, interesting uh it's a whimsy and it's like an odd quirky sense of humor you know like i will put a hat on top of a hat <laughs> on top of another hat <laughs> you know or, or one mismatched button often for me it's in the magic of the collaboration of the with the actor of like how something is worn um and it is it's like one one pant like will be flipped up or, or sleeves get rolled and then you know rumpled or i leave wrinkles in a costume like um and sometimes I'm, I'm probably, you know, I'll say like, please leave this show. I've definitely told an actor, I'm like, never do this to another designer. But for me, for this show, please leave this shirt in a rumpled heap in the corner. That's where I would like this to live. Not on the hanger. I don't want anyone to see this. You know, like, it's got to stay this way because this character doesn't own an iron. This character's never seen an iron, you know. And so there's little, I think, little moments of, of like, lived reality that, it's very important that those exist in my costumes, that there's not a perfection. I don't, I don't know what that is. Like who are perfect people? Even in a period drama, I don't know who those people are. I don't want to be them, they sound boring. <laughs> I don't think they exist, but uh, I no, I completely, I completely hear you. I have Mel, same question. Yeah, I think it really, I mean, I'm really <laughs> agreeing with everyone what I'm saying, but I really think it is like, for me, where my playfulness gets to come out, um, you know, and I think like, I don't know, I'm curious if y'all do this, I'm sure you do it, you know, I, I think like as artists, we really create from memory. Um, and for me, I know, like, sometimes I'll see someone on the street and be like, ooh, I want to put that on stage someday. Or, oh, that's a fun image. Or, okay, I'm going to file that away in my little brain. And there will be moments and shows where I get to pull it out. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that would that would work here. That fun, like, thing that I saw once. Or, like, I don't know, but also just weird things. Like, I one of the last shows I did before the pandemic was a production of Everybody. And... Um, for the 
I can't even remember. I think they're called the virtues. It's like this, you know, beauty and senses and mind. There are these characters that are, you know, these sort of abstract values. Um, and we had like headwear made for them um, with the names of their virtues on it. And a lot of that was informed by like, I don't know why, I don't even know, cause I went back and looked at it. I don't even think, I don't know. I just kept thinking Phantom Tollbooth, like this thing that I read and watched as a child. Oh, yeah. And I was like, that feels right for this show, <laughs> you know? So I don't know, I think, yeah, that, that's kind of how that shows up in my work is like these weird memories that I've collected. That I think brings it back to our point about uh, finding those touchstones for you and that that image means something to you. Um, and so you kind of like continue to evoke it. I find that really exciting when you um, can find things like that, where you're just like this, this made such an impression on me that it continues to like live and evolve in my work. Um, I think for me, uh, the biggest thing that comes through from me as a designer in my work is my perspective. I think that we have as designers, um, for better or worse, we are always in our work and our points of view on things are the, are the reason that uh, one person would be brought onto a production kind of instead of another. Mm -hmm. I think that you, even if it's like subtle and subversive, your kind of, your thoughts on a character come through and how you dress them. And though it is always important to ask yourself, like whose story is it? Um, why are you telling it? Whose point of view is this from? I think that there's a little bit of handholding with you as an artist where you are standing there kind of with the story, pushing it out, being like, okay, this is, this is what we're trying to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah totally. um, so that said, what would be something that you would consider a dream project? Let's start with Mel. Oh man, you know, honestly, at this point in time, it's like the creative stuff, yes, absolutely. And also a dream project is where everyone gets paid fairly and compensated fairly for their time. And tech is humane and not like six, 10 out of 12s in a row. Um, so that for me right now, is a dream project, is really looking at a more humane way of producing theater. Definitely. Um, that said, are there, we can, does, it, does anyone wanna hop around after that answer or would we like to talk a little bit about what we'd like to advocate for as designers? I feel like after that, it, it's like, you are like, oh yeah, I wanna- That's in my job. But yeah, it's, you know, some, let's do, let's do uh, a sci-fi show sounds, but I, I completely agree with you. Um, I think that there, that would, that seems so obvious and yet it is not a reality right now. So as the costume designer, what are some things that you advocate for um, when you are in a production? Let's start there. Uh, Mel, would you like to start? <laughs> Sure. I'm sorry if I hijacked that. No, question. no. I think I think you are bringing up things that that are also really worthy topics to discuss. So yeah, let's it's, let's talk. We can talk about dream projects later. Let's talk I mean, about what we want to advocate for. Yeah, because you know I think the thing with the pandemic is like, of course, we're all like creatively like yearning, but at the same time, for me, mostly what I've been thinking about during the pandemic is how do we get fair labor practices in place? How do we make sure things shift when we get back, you know? And um, as a costume designer, I mean, the things that I advocate for are what I think are really basic, but a lot of producers still don't seem to know at this point, but a big thing is costume designers need um, access to 
the, you know, especially for off-Broadway shows, but we need access to the company credit cards. We can't be expected to put expenses on our own cards. Um, that hurts everyone. And then the other thing that I really pay attention to is how my assistants are treated and how they're compensated. And anyone on my team, really, if, if I'm working with a Wigs person, I want to make sure that they feel like their work is valued. Um, you know, because I just think it's, yeah, a lot of the time we as designers are working close up with the wardrobe crew, with the dressers, and we know like the amount of grit and energy and effort that goes into things. And so we're able to really speak up for people who are working within the costume realm um, in a way that others might not no. Completely agree. I think um, logging hours is something that more designers and assistants are starting to do now so that uh, producers and teams realize kind of what that pay actually looks like. I think in addition to those points, which are all fantastic, um, responsible sourcing for where things come from that is something that is really important and often overlooked, that you as the designer can advocate for which businesses you support um, and that there's a lot of power in that. Uh, but also uh, wanting to hear from others, Dominique. Yeah, um, something that was surprising, but in a delightful way, um, was that I started to be more vocal about the team that I wanted to acquire in terms of costuming and advocating for more people of color to be on that team, whether it's, and there was times when I took a portion out of my fee to add to theirs so that they their number wasn't just like this abstract thing, it was just like an even plane. And it's any way about it, but that gave me more gravitas to then advocate for other things within that specific project and then the next project to um, come after. So I found that before I would just accept whatever was given to me and there's nothing wrong with doing that, right? Because people have their own teams, they have their own costume shop managers, they have their own in-house uh, wig designers. But if you're able to advocate for um, certain certain individuals to come with you to do certain projects i think that should be a conversation in the beginning mm -hmm. um and i even advocated for their salary to be more and it's again it's just putting it into the nexus of this is where i'm at in terms of just my mental capacity and i want you to know that this is under the table in terms of pay and we can do better than that even if it doesn't happen at that moment because at the end of the day we have the discretion to take the project or to not take the project, right? So if you feel like you're being underpaid and you take a project, it's gonna show, it's gonna come up in other ways and that's not fair to you and that's not fair for the project um, as well. So that has been a, that, yeah, I think we, we definitely talked about this Dev and Lux before about like, it's kind of starts with like, I don't know about everyone else, but for me, it started as a whisper being like, can we negotiate? And then it was just like, hey, can we negotiate this fee? And then now it's just like, hi. So when I design a show and it's in this demographic, I don't work less than this. Because one, <laughs> I think a lot of times if you go into a profession and there's hesitation in terms of advocating for yourself, other people can smell that and they can sense that. And they are on the business side of it. So they're just looking at the numbers, right? So they'll give you whatever they can crunch in. But if you advocate for yourself more, they'll see, okay, this person understands that the demographic of this particular project, it's it's in this number, but let's see if we can work, let's see if we can pull it from other places. Let's see, it'll, it'll give them the like start on the engine to be like, okay, is there more money? Um, and it's not about greed, it's just about being compensated, like Mel said, for the work that you're doing. I don't know, and this is even the shiniest of shiny costume designers. I don't know not one costume designer that can adequately say they've gotten paid for every single second, every single blood, every single sweat and tear that they put into a production, even if you're making like these six figures on these multi million dollar movies, right? So 
that's what it is. It's just healthy practices. Um, as, as if it's a salary, right? As if you're negotiating a salary for any other job, you're doing a service. So you should be compensated for that. Yeah. Agree. I think there is a lot of secrecy about money in this profession that took a, a, a long time for me to realize person. I know, um, that people, people are just not comfortable talking about it when in fact, there's, there's not really a reason for there to be this level of secrecy and that your designer is really the one who is at the disadvantage by not talking about money. Uh, the other point being that other, other designers are negotiating. You should negotiate. You should know your worth uh, mm -hmm. and negotiate correctly for a project. But I think that comes with having a little more experience mm -hmm. and realizing that to your point, Dominique, when you are underpaid for something, it shows mm -hmm. and you're exhausted. You mm -hmm. shouldn't have to take, you know, four jobs to be able to do an off off Broadway show. Mm -hmm. They should be able to pay you to do the show. Uh, but Deb, I'd love to hear from you. Hard to follow all of that because I'm like, yep, yep, yep. Uh, I think for me, it comes down to three things, uh, pay equity, team equity, and time equity. Um, one thing that I didn't really realize until I started working as a set designer and, and doing the same show as a costume designer, you know, like I would look at those two contracts from the same theater and my scenic contract was like maybe a thousand dollars more sometimes, you know, maybe 500, but more, always more be a scene designer in the costume wow. designer. So I am negotiating these two things side by side, you know, and saying like, how come in this contract, <laughs> I am getting paid more and I only have these 10 things I have to do. And yet in the costume designer contract, which should be the parallel contract, I have 20 things that you're holding me to, you know, whatever that is. But it's like, I look mm -hmm. at a contract like that and I wanna be like, who hurt you? <laughs> back in the day that you had to put all these things into this contract because you know at small to mid-sized companies that's how contracts are often made is in reaction to something that happened somebody got screwed along the way and then said now we're going to do all these things so i look at straight up pay equity and i hope that theaters can look at even though the labor is is different and the timetables are, are different these jobs are not better or lesser or greater you know than another um and in terms of team, just straight up having a team, I would love to be at every theater where I had a, you know, the wig designer and a wardrobe designer to make it so that wasn't also me. Um, and, you know, meanwhile, again, with scenic, there's painters, there's pop people, there's carpenters, and like theaters don't box at there being at least a technical director. Where I was like, where's my technical director? Do I get a customer shop manager? Oh no, I have to run all over town, spend my own money and do all my own receipts and accounting and hiring and I have to build my own shop. And like, so if I want any of that, I have to do it. And I've become a really good manager because I've had to do it. <laughs> and I'm like, why, why is this different? This should not be different. Those jobs are parallel. I know because I do them both. And mm. so that is something that's really struck me in the past couple of years. I'm like, I don't know why it's so different. And I, I can only say maybe it's a gender thing. Maybe it's the, you know, costuming with women's work or whatever it is, whatever these things that have come out in the, in this past century that have just kind of like made it much, much harder for us to even say, like, can I negotiate? I mean, it is, there's so many people out there just whispering and that sucks. <laughs> And yeah, maybe I've just reached the point in my career where I'm like, oh, but enough, enough already. You know, um, I have companies that I will still work for, you know, where I'm doing a lot of this work, but the conversation is happening because I'm like, these things have to change. So I'm hopeful for the future. I don't mean to like lambast and run, you know, I am actually really hopeful that companies are starting to see this and they're going, oh, right equity is important in this moment where we're, we're constantly talking about racial equity and like inclusion and diversity and all these things. I'm like, okay, good. Let's, let's go back to pay equity. Let's go back to the thing we were talking about in the 1970s yeah. and end it. Yeah. So, that. Yeah. Mic drop moment. Absolutely. 
um, I think mm. it's it's so infuriating that this conversation is still happening, but there I think there is something um, some hope to glean from that we are having a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. but, Mel. Um, did you, oh, I didn't ask my next question yet. Next question. Um, <laughs> sorry. I, like, my brain jumped I mean, around. I, I was like, Mel, would you like question. to talk? And then I was like, no. Um, what advice would you give your younger self? That's a great segue because as I was listening to all this, my response in my head was, and I am telling my students not to put up with any of this. You know, like I think, I think that's the big thing for me that I hope that as educators right now, at least I'm doing is really being like, well, I was taught a different thing of like, okay, you stand it, you know, you like, you have to pay your dues and you have to like say, you know, take these things that aren't fair or aren't, you know, equitable. And for me, I'm just sort of burning all that to the ground in my classroom and being like, no, paying dues is bullshit. None of y'all have to pay your dues because who are the people who are still paying dues? You know, like look at the people still paying dues. Very often it's women and people of color. And so who gets to not pay dues, right? It, it, it's, it's totally a facet of white supremacy. Um, so, I mean, for me, I think, this ties, when, ties in with the advice that I would give my younger self is you have more power than you think you do. And you do not ever have to stay in a work situation that is undervaluing you or exploiting you or abusing you. Um, yeah. Fantastic advice. Uh, Dominique. Mm -hmm. I love this conversation, it's so good. Um, <laughs> Deb was like, no, Mel's like, no. Um, <laughs> I would give my younger self, what would I tell my younger self? I would say, sis, spread your wings. Um, if this pandemic has taught me anything is that like, you are not your profession and costume design is one of the many things that you can do, right? You can also be an image architect. You can be a stylist. You can be a consultant. You can make picture frames. like. The boom, the booming renaissance that I've seen with my friends and my colleagues and my counterparts on just like how they took their creativity that was so specific before. It was just a very tunnel vision and now it's just blossomed. Um, it's actually inspirational. So that's also my younger self to like, yeah, sure, have your ambition, have your tunnel vision, but also know that it's okay. You don't have to feel guilty of wanting to branch out. You don't have to feel guilty of being like, I actually love film too, right? Maybe I have this whole Ann Roth thing going on. You know, like, and that's okay as well. Um, also, I would say, if you instinctually feel like something is not safe, get out of there pronto. Um, because sadly, I've been in situations in which it hasn't been safe and I stayed because mm -hmm. I, in my mind was like, I'm black, I have to stay because you can't be black and leave a job. Like, what is that? And, I'm, and now I'm just like, don't make what? But it goes back into like this like preconceived feminist like notion of just like you have to endure you have to always endure like it's not enough they want your rib they want your heart too and that's not the case because when people recognize your worth they will compensate you in every single facet for your worth and you will not feel like you're being taken advantage of you will feel like you are a part that's why it's so beautiful to find those directors that you love those choreographers that you love those light designers that you love those theaters that you love because it's not even about the money at that point. It's just about the respect. So do not stay anywhere that it feels unsafe. Always go towards the respect and the light and know that you're way more than just one title. Yeah. Deb. Same I question. Think, oh, so many different things. Um, I think, you know, like, I guess it's two things. Like, don't apologize for being you, you know, I think is one thing that I would definitely tell my younger self. Because I sculpt around an early career being like, I'm just going to 
try to like want to for everybody to like me, you know, and that was like, super important because I just like wanted to wanted to fit in, you know, wanted to, to be liked, wanted to be be wanted, uh so I would get more jobs, people like me, you know, and that, that thing sort of built on itself. And so I think like <laughs> I told my younger self, calm down, it's gonna be okay. You'll find your people. Um because I think that like I feel like I, I wasted some time like trying to be someone else and trying to, to be like others. And mm -hmm. and really my, my greatest asset is just sort of been just in being me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that I, I could just sort of calm down. That <laughs> I didn't have to like impress others, you know? And like, so I like kept on putting myself away. I put my identity away. Like, you know, just, I shoved everything into a box for a long, mm -hmm. long time. Um, which is sad <laughs> in retrospect because I could have gotten so much done so much sooner, I think. But uh, yeah, it's a huge, a huge part of what I would tell. Wow. I think I would tell myself that it's it's okay not to know the answer to everything. It's fine. It's it's okay to not have a career path that feels like it moves in a straight line to have one that kind of likes to meander as long as you feel uh, valued and creatively fulfilled. Um, My career path is a straight line. I don't know what that is. Well, I think when you have a job that has you in like more of a corporate setting, uh, mm -hmm. To me, there seems like a more obvious kind of ladder, but with costume design, it really does feel like, and sometimes you assist, and sometimes you shop, and sometimes you're doing lots of things, and the scale of your job is constantly um, ebbing and flowing. You might work on a really large show and then go down and do just a, a two-hander, like mm -hmm. our part of what makes the job so interesting and exciting is how different every job is. So I think mm -hmm. there's something really beautiful in not, not knowing where the next job is necessarily going to take you and not feeling like uh, you need to kind of push forward on a constant uphill trajectory. I think I think we we do do that. It just feels it feels uh, sometimes it can feel like ever since every process is different, we are step taking steps backwards when really we're always moving forward. It's just different. I guess that is a, a lot of things to tell my younger self, but I think it would be just it, it'll be OK. It's OK not to know. Just keep moving forward. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so mm -hmm. we are just going to check and see if there are any questions in the chat. We are open to answer anything that has come up. Um, in the meantime, while we wait and see if there are any questions, does anyone have what they would consider a hard rule? for costume designers. And I will open this up to just kind of popcorning for a little bit. Mm. Mm. Hard rule. I think um, one that's been mentioned already is like, don't spend your own money. Don't spend your own money. Yeah. Don't work for free. Don't work for free. Sleep. Get yeah. sleep. Sleep. Because if you don't sleep, you will get sick. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> if you don't sleep, your body will sleep for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know. That was too real. That was so real. Oh. And here is a question. Mm -hmm. Um, though we'll let Dominique, do you have anything you want to finish out with hard rules? Um, I don't know. Oh, always check in with yourself before you take in a job. 
like always, no matter how shiny the job may seem or how basic or whatever, always check in with your inner self and be like, is this the right thing for me to do? I think those are all fantastic. Um, so the question that has come in is, what do you look for in a costume shop manager when at a large theater? Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, Dominique, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, every time I go into a costume shop, before I step into the costume shop, I think the universe that there is a costume shop. And um, I initially always ask the costume shop manager, how do they like to work? Um, I just find it a form of respect and it kind of just like shows them that like, yes, I'm here as a professional, but you're gonna be here once I leave. So if you don't like things to be in a certain area, if this is like, do not touch, like let me know because I sprawl out when I'm in a shop. And um, uh, it's, it's something that should be talked about in the beginning, but in terms of what I look for in a costume shop manager in a larger theater, I think um, I look for their input, actually. Like a lot of costume shop managers are kind of surprised and I'm like, why? Because my philosophy is uh, if I don't know something, someone in this room most likely will. And I'm always up for suggestions. I'm not a closed off type of designer that's like, I all hell know all things and you bless with me. Like, I'm not like that because I think that's unrealistic. And there's something um, within shop managers I think is pretty magical because they think as if they are costume designers all the time to then yeah. put out the fires <laughs> that they foresee kind of happening and that's the blessing because for us in which a uh, utopic world is that we only focus like on the design so our one job once you step into that costume shop is to focus on the design with god's grace they handle the budget right in terms of the restocking they do all that setting up the fitting room you have an assistant luckily to do that but for us we just focus on the design and for them they're like i see your design this is how it's going to be brought to life so and a costume shop manager, I look for someone that also thinks with the designer brain. Um, is They're open for a conversation to talk about things, um, to see what we can and cannot do. Also, if something is out of whack, out of budget, out of context, just out of time, and quite frankly, in terms of like labor, let me know, I will adjust. So also one that's very communicative, like communicative in terms of like where we're at, what your dreams look like and what we can actually do. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And then sometimes they just become like the best of your friends for production too, which is actually really nice. So yeah. be nice to shop managers. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're your friends. They are your friends. Oh, always. <laughs> <laughs> when you're, when you're coming in for a production and you're meeting a shop manager, they are the person, they know their shop better than you do. Mm -hmm. So I think I am looking for them to collaborate with me on how we can tell this story together. Like I, I am hoping to find someone who will partner with me to kind of get things done where we know that it is a conversation. Uh, but I think they, they know who on their team would be the right fit for things. So I put a lot of trust in shop managers when I go to theaters yeah. because they know. Yeah. Uh, Deb. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, they know the resources. Like often when I'm coming in, I have like not been in that city or like I know some things, but really don't know others. And I, you know, it'll have been a year or two since I've been back. So stores will have closed, new resources will have opened. And that person is the one with the pulse on, on, the, on the area who has relationships with people. So yeah, I'm looking for I'm looking for an advocate and I'm looking for, you know, a research manager and I'm, I'm you know, I'm looking for, for a buddy. I want to, I want someone I can spend 80 hours with in tight quarters, you know, um, yeah. I just spend a lot of time in cars and shop managers shopping for things. So I want someone who's, who's fun, you know, and who enjoys their job. Yeah. Uh, and Mel. Yeah, I mean, all true. You know, I'm really looking for a collaborator and an ally and an advocate. Um, 
And I think, I mean, you all said, I think a lot of things that I want to say, but I'll say that the best moments I've had with the costume shop managers that I've worked, like the most enjoyable collaborations have been when we're sitting in tech and there's something going on and I just can't figure it out. And I'm like, what do you think? What do we do? I don't know. And more often than not, they're like, well, this is the thing. And I'm like, yes, absolutely. You are correct. Let's do that. Um, those, those have really been the best collaborations for me where you really feel like, yeah, you've got this other brain that you're bouncing ideas around with in tech um, or problem solving or just even, yeah, fun. Fun, I think, is really important too. And on that note, um, I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you so much uh, to the panel. If you could um, shout out uh, the th anything you have coming up next, um, any social media handles and where we can kind of follow you. Um, Mel, if you could get us started. Yeah, um, you can follow me at Electric Translation. That is actually my tarot IG. Um, I am sort of taking a sabbatical from theater for a little bit <laughs> and really focusing my energies on other creative practices. So that's where I recommend following me. And of course, you can always find my design website, melissaevaung.com. Fantastic. Uh, Deb. Well, you can find me on Instagram at IndaPenguin. Uh, and combo work and selfies and the ramen I ate, but you know, it's fun. Get to know me there. Uh, and then my website, debsivany.com. Um, and what's coming up? I will be designing once at the Hangar Theater this summer in their newly built outdoor venue, which should be super fun. And I'll be working on um, a site specific piece uh, called, uh, which is the culmination of distance frequencies at Rorschach Theater. Uh, which has been the seven month sort of um, subscription box project that I've been working on and writing with a team of collaborators. And so we're finally doing our live show this July in DC. Uh, and Dominique. Hello everyone. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, uh, Dominique Fawn Hill underscore, um, Dominique underscore Fawn underscore Hill on Instagram. And my website is the same, Dominique Fawn Hill. Dot com. Uh, upcoming project uh, is actually really exciting. It's um, going to be in New York and it's called Darker Chronicles X and it will be premiering at The Shed July, no, June, June 5th. Um, <laughs> so I'm super excited about that because it deals with XR and VR and Afrofuturism and all that jazz. So Super cool. Um, mm -hmm. And Thank you, everyone. You can follow me on Instagram at LuxHawk. Uh, website is the same, www.luxhawk.com. And you can see my work uh, now. It just opened in Syracuse Stages production of I and You. Thank you so much to USITT for having us. Oh, thank you. Uh, what an amazing conversation. And someone has an amazing dog in the background. Uh, so thank you all for, for joining us. Thanks for everybody out there. Uh, again, thank you for your time tonight. Our next community conversation will be uh, around the No More 10 Out of 12 series, continuing on with the Academy on May 19th. Today's session was made possible through membership dollars and the Tanisha Jefferson Fund for Inclusion. You can join USIT or donate to the fund at usitt.org. Thank you all for joining us and please take good, good care of yourselves. Good night.